Hello everyone, welcome to our focus on video as a part of that focus. We're going to be looking at video editing today and I have with me Alex Dunedin and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Alex uh, who will be um, imparting his understandings around video editing to everybody. Now I know that some of you um, already have significant editing skills. So this video is primarily for those people who are who self-identify as beginners uh, and or kind of in intermediate edit editing uh, video editing users. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Alex then. Alex is the director of Ragged University. And if you've not heard of Ragged, it's an informal learning organisation where anybody can do a talk on a subject they want to share with others. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, I, I also work on uh, Ragged and we go into informal spaces, social spaces such as cafes and pubs, and people can do talks uh, with a little bit of food and something to drink. So it's a very nice atmosphere. So that's what um, Alex has invested a lot of his time with. Uh, but here he's going to talk about video editing. So to start with, Alex, I wonder if you could talk about the technological setup that you've got here, wh which we're using to make this video. Right. Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm using a Windows operating system and that allows me to use very popular software. I prefer popular software that's got a proven track record because generally that brings with it a large community of people that I can uh, draw on their expertise when I need it. Uh, it also means that uh, the, uh, this expertise is often available in places like YouTube if I, if I run into a problem and want to know how to do something or resolve an issue. So uh, the, there's a, a good bit of RAM. Uh, I've got 16 gigabytes. And for video processing, you generally want to have uh, a fair bit of RAM. So the more complicated the videos you do, uh, the more you will require computational power, stronger processors, and more random access memory, RAM chips. Uh, so, um, the software suite that I use is uh, Adobe Premiere, and uh, I use the 2017 edition. Um, the, uh, there are newer editions and uh, in general the interfaces are, carry forward uh, successful features which uh, provide familiarity and it's that familiarity that often defines the industry um, standards. So a lot of people will have become used to the standards that have been uh, set up by Adobe Photoshop. And working in that environment, the way that tools are laid out on palettes has now been uh, become common language. So you'll see it in photo editors like GIMP, uh, which is the open source variation that you can get for uh, Windows systems, Linux systems, and Mac systems. Thank you. Would you like to say just a little bit about the recording devices that you're using to make this um, video? Right, so we're, we're recording, I'm doing, using Ice Cream Screen Recorder, which is a nice small application. It's got a light footprint, uh, so it doesn't uh, draw up a lot of my computer's resources. And I'm also using a Zoom H1N Handy Corder. This is a pocket audio recorder that's got very, very nice microphones. 
it's, it's a great um, device to own to do interviews and it picks up and and um, processes sound in a way that makes it easier certainly for uh, amateurs to get good quality sound files that they can then go ahead and work on to clean up for producing things like videos uh, or podcasts. I should say in relation to all of this, Alex, that you're a video restorer. So you work with organisations, um, editing videos, um, some of them which are not very well filmed. And you're also a video restorer, as in you take old films and you restore them to... Uh, to the extent that that's possible. Um, I thought people might want to know that. Uh. Yes, it's, I think, a useful set of skills to have, uh, particularly if you are not uh, a trained audio-video technician or professional, because often you won't have the best of equipment mm -hmm. and you'll have to use commonly available equipment to capture maybe a local event or or piece together stuff from using a mobile phone for example but restoration skills means you can make the most of what you can uh, lay down in digital files thank you right so should we look a little bit at the interface and if we can imagine somebody who's encountering this for the first time, the video interface. And if you could guide people through a little bit that interface, that would be really useful. Okay, so um, what I've got on screen here um, is Adobe Premiere Pro CC 2017, where it's, it's just opened up. And uh, this is the first window that, that gets selected where you're creating a new project. So as with everything, labeling things so that you understand where you're, uh, what project it is um, and how you're storing your information on your computer over time is really important. The, as time goes along, you will need to know, lay your hands on your work <laughs> at any given point and computers get cluttered. So pick your project and this is uh, this will save all the, the editing work that you are going to do. So today I've taken some footage of Antonia Darda and uh, I've yet to edit this into a final production and this is what we're going to do today. So um, in general, it, um, Adobe Premiere is mostly set up to be running out of the box, so um, I wouldn't. I won't go into the the settings here. Um, I'm just going to take you through how to um, do create use rudimentary skills to make uh, a simple video. Okay, so here we have uh, down here. This is where we're going to be doing a lot of our work. This is where we're going to be creating a timeline. And typically it's the timeline uh, that constitutes film editing. We're going to be um, taking the, the, the video files, all the different files, bringing them into the application here. So down here in this window, uh, I can navigate to the project. And this is where we uh, organize the files we will be using. So typically you have video files, you have audio files, and you have graphic elements. Up here, um, this this is uh, a window that's used to view files that you've brought in to your your uh, reserve here, and uh, work on them from. You you can select 
parts of the file to drag onto the timeline down here. Or you can do things like look at the effects. So we'll, this will make more sense in a couple mm -hmm. of minutes when we mm -hmm. go through it. Mm -hmm. And here, this window here is largely uh, the window that shows the final, how the final product is going to be seen. And as we layer up files on the timeline here, and as the cursor moves along through the timeline, um, it, it represents where you are in the film. Yeah. So th that's what you're seeing through here. And of course, you've got your uh, menus up here. And you can do things like um, sort out project settings. Again, I highly recommend YouTube as a place to learn about Adobe Premiere. There's a very big community of excellent videos. So I'm sure that must be the same in countries that don't have YouTube as a as a significant resource. I think there are always video editing good um, videos on ways of video editing because people who do vid video mm -hmm. editing tend to be good at uh, um, talking about it, although that's not always the case. Yes, I, I, well, apologies. I, I realise that. Uh, uh, certain websites won't be available to everybody, but I guess any any video uh, waterhole where lots of communities gather and share what they've been working on creatively, mm -hmm. Meta Cafe, there's Vimeo, uh, and in different countries, I'm sure that there are lots of rich spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, just to say that um, um, in some video editing software, I can think of, for example, Shotcut, you can, you can modify the interface so you can put things in different places yes. and take things away if you don't need them so that um, you've got less things to deal with on screen. Is it the case in Adobe Premiere? Yes, so you can, if you like, change the dimensions and order uh, as you need them. Uh, and there are typically uh, changes that happen in different versions, you see. Uh, so um, it, the, there is a level of continuity and people have their their... Uh, interfaces set up uh, as as they generally are, have have learned to set them up and how they've become comfortable to do that. Uh, I try to keep uh, working things as they come out, as as they're presented to me, um, so that I can keep tracking that level of familiarity that will be referred to in creative communities. Uh, because I, I use creative communities a lot to tap into knowledge when I need it. Thank you. Right. So let's then, I, I'm sure you're, you're, our imagined beginner will want to know how you get a, re, a, a video file into the video editing area. Right. <laughs> okay. Could you take us through that? So uh, I like to think about this uh, uh, a little bit like cooking. You know, you you prepare your your uh, ingredients, and you're going to the cooking process is, is about assembling these in in the order that you need. So down here uh, in the import media area. Um, you have that, the opportunity to create what are called new bins. Now, a bin is a, uh, the, the expression used to uh, express folders, containers in which you're going to keep files of a type. So I'm going to create a 
been here for video. Essentially, a means of organising. Yes. You know, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so you can imagine if you are creating a two-hour video, mm-hmm. and there are maybe lots of interviews or presentations, and you end up with twenty video files and twenty uh, audio files and forty uh, graphic elements. It it helps reduce the chaos Mm. and the complexity by creating folders in which uh, things are kept. So I will create three folders here, uh, or three bins, uh, one for uh, video, one for audio, and one for graphics. and this is because I uh, do audio editing too. So I'll do some filming and uh, take that raw footage and I'll separate the audio files from the video files and I'll export them. And then I'll use a different set of software to edit the audio file, so I may want to remove some of the background noise, Mm -hmm. and I may want to add some uh, music underneath in the background. Um, And uh, that's why it's good to create different bins here. And the graphic elements, uh, that's that covers things like, say you wanted to put a logo on, or you designed a title page in in another application. Um, again, it's, it's simply about keeping things in a, in a way where you can lay your hands t- uh, easily on things and it's not too, too visually complicated. So once we've created the the bins, right? I can just simply double click on the bin and it will bring that bin, open it up as a window. And I can double click on that. And we're going to navigate to the video files. Antonio Darda. And what we're going to do is import all of these and they're now being brought in uh, and will sit as uh, elements that I can use to layer up the film. Okay, so we'll go up and so you can see you can adjust the the windows as you need them. And next I'm going to get a graphic element from my pictures and so Ragged University logo, right? And later, we're also going to add um, things like, so down here, next to the new bin item, uh, you can create things like titles. So obviously, at the beginning of this, we'll be labeling for the viewer, what they're just about to see, and you're you're going to be seeing the final product um, uh, with a title. Um, an adjustment layer is also useful, and that's a way of putting effects like changing contrast and brightness of of video 
without putting those effects directly, um, attaching those directly to the video file, which confers your an ability to be more flexible um, as you manipulate and move around uh, your elements in the timeline. Okay, and audio. So I've told you that we, uh, I, I export the audio and I do audio editing and then re-import that so it's better quality. Um, audio, the audio file folder is where that will be, those files will be stored. So thank you for taking us through the process of importing files, Alex. I wonder if you can now move on to the editing itself and whether you could show us through key functionality for your imagined beginner stroke intermediate <laughs> <laughs> uh, video editor. Right. So, well, we start with the video files themselves. And it's quite intuitive once you get to use this. So firstly, we'll start with understanding this, the tool we're using. So this is the tool palette here. And mostly the, it is the selection tool that were, um, gets used here. So, um, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to show you a, a, a very simple way of creating film. Um, so it's, I simply move over the piece of video that I would, uh, want to work on and I click and I hold on that click. And I drag that across here and I drop it onto the timeline. And you can see here that it's appeared above, All right? So um, this is the viewing window and in here, when you can see there's a, a blue line that sits around which panel you are working in. So if I click down in the timeline area, the blue line moves to there. And that means that whatever keyboard shortcuts you use or wherever you're uh, working, it's that area that will receive the command. So I'll click in here. And by pressing apostrophe, we can bring up you the, mean whole, the, the key. The key. You're using the keyboard keyboard at this point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if I if I use the term hot key or sh keyboard shortcuts, it means that I'm using the keyboard to execute a command. So do you tend to excuse me, Alex? Do you tend to use the uh, the hotkeys more than, for example, using your mouse. And, yeah. I, I think, yeah, uh, it, it's an indispensable thing to learn using both the keyboard and the mouse to work in interfaces, interfaces like this. Mm -hmm. It saves you, uh, it allows you to do more. It saves you a lot of time. So, for example, three very useful okay. shortcuts um, would be um, control, holding down control and X is uh, cut, cut something you've selected. Control, hold, holding down control and pressing V is pasting that thing that you've selected uh, and cut and holding down control and pressing C is to copy. So these hotkeys, uh, I've, I've found 
very helpful in multiple applications, and often they're the same keyboard shortcuts in different applications. So what we have here is uh, the enlarged viewing window, and you can see down here the timeline. So I'm grabbing the cursor and moving that along. And at the moment, we can see that it's slightly underexposed, a bit dark, and it's a very wide frame here. And uh, this is this is the raw footage that we're going to be working through. So I press the keyboard shortcut again, the apostrophe key, to return that window to normal size. And we're back in the four paneled view, the five paneled view that allows us to work on this. Right. So you can also see now I'll just uh, open up. You can see here that a project file. This is the this is the file that holds the layered sequence of information. Uh, so as I grab a second, um, Alex, when you say the layered se sequence of information, right? What do you mean? So, right, I will show you by layering up some information here. Right, so you saw me there take a second file and putting it on the end there. I'm going to take a third file. Now you can see that the space here has become filled. So I'm going to adjust this back here. give us more space right but you've got this slider down here and that allows you to navigate in the timeline right and here is for example nine minutes mark 10 minutes mark 11 minutes mark 12 minutes mark uh, we can see the main speaker here Antonia Dardler and that's the main feature. So I'm going to be cutting away the, the information that's not necessary in the information to leave the focus on uh, what Antonia was saying that day so that uh, uh, we end up with a, a nice clean production. But what we want to do is be able to see the whole of the timeline. And what we can do how we can do that is by clicking on one of these end circles in the slider and by making that slider then fill the whole space it, it occupies, you can see that all the timeline is now in view. I can tell from this information, I can tell that now there is uh, 32 minutes of footage there, roughly. And here we have the audio file. So I can mute that or obscure the, the picture. So say if as you uh, as you layer things up, so the the question you asked you about layering things. So I'm going to go to graphic elements, right? I'm going. To, you can see above here. Uh, so the different channels: visual one, video two, video three. 
down here, video, audio 1, audio 2, and audio 3. So I can take different files, and I can put them on top here and below here. And the things that are further, on to uh, further to the top are the things that have priority in terms of video. So I'm going to grab this logo and put it here just for the sake of demonstration. And you can see it's appeared there. Yeah. Can you see and that? And that beca that's because you have the related track superimposed on the other tracks? Right. Yes. So you can see, right? So the video two track is, no, we can't see this graphic element. We can see it in the window here, mm. but we can't see it really very clearly or, or at all down here. But that is because it's only, uh, it's not very big in terms of timescape. So I'm going to zoom in. Mm by doing this, right? You saw how I did that? I'm grabbing hold of the circle on the end of slider and shortening up the slider. And you can see that this, the graphic element, the ragged logo, is, uh, well, I can now tell its duration is only five seconds. Mm -hmm. And that element, graphic element, how it's displaying in the timeline is proportionate in size to 32 minutes. Right. right so that, 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 that icon, that ragged logo would display on the screen for five seconds. Yes. Video. So, I'm going to show you a, a keyboard shortcut here again. So if you hold down the Alt key and wherever I've placed holding my cursor, my selection tool cursor, right? Um, and I use the wheel of my mouse to zoom in. It also it zooms in on the timeline and I can see, you can see that five seconds is now appearing much bigger and it's much easier to work with, you see. So I can now obscure that by switching off that video channel, right? And you can switch on and off these layers as you would like. This is what you mean by muting, right? Yes, so muting the audio and obscuring the video. So that's... So that you can work on individual tracks. Yes. Right. Sometimes you, you need to be able to focus on one element mm. before you then see them in context. Mm. Right, so here's an example. Right. So I don't want this logo obscuring the, the speaker, Antonio. So I'm going to click on that and you can see up here the details, the, its information has appeared. Uh, and it, we're looking at the effects, the effects controls of it. Right. Now, say I want this um, graphic element to uh, exist in the timeline for much longer. There are lots of other options. So by right-clicking on that, you can see by right-clicking, I've brought up lots of other options here. Mm -hmm. right? And I can select the duration the speed and the duration of the clip. And uh, let's put this at five minutes 
and five seconds. Right? You can see instantly that now exists as we zoom out on our timeline as a much larger element which is uh, a layer on top of. Now, I'm going to move this along to the front. Right. And I want to, let's say I want to have this the same length as all the video. So I'm going to, you see how when I move the selection tool onto the end of the graphic element, it becomes a little red black bracket with an arrow. So, right. See that? Okay. So when it's like that, I can click and drag that out to extend its duration so that it's going to now be there for the entire duration of, of the footage below. But I don't want that logo sat obscuring any important uh, footage. So up here we can see its position on the screen. So it's X and Y coordinates here. So by changing uh, its, well let's change its scale first. So down here we can open up a slider under most of these things and uh, I can make it smaller but I can also increase its size by making it 200% See, so I've ch entered the value, I've changed the value there to 200%, I press return and you can see it's now twice as twice the size it was. It's two hundred percent the size. So let's look at four hundred percent. This is how you can change uh, the the nature, the physical makeup of each graphic element. Now we're working with a logo here. Um, but say you wanted to um, add, uh, superimpose another video onto the existing video, you would use the same operations functions, would you? Yes. Right. Right. So remember, you're you're working within the computational power of the computer you have. So the more complex you make your video, the more power you will need. Mm. So um, let's take a video and I drag that up here. And that, you can see it split the, the video to the upper video channels and the audio to the lower video channels, right? And it's now displaying this uh, video three channel. That's got priority. If I um, toggle, toggle its output, we are now seeing everything that's underneath the layering. Mm -hmm. But then I'm going to switch that video output on, off. Right. So we'll get a bigger size there. Off, on, off, on. But 
let's reduce the scale of video 3 by 50%. Mm -hmm. So that's half its size. That's a third of its size. For the purposes of illustration, let's say you've got two pieces of footage that you want to display within one uh, one final uh, video output. Um, what I want to do is show maybe the back of the room. If it were on the back of uh, the room, I want to move this graphic element, this, so they change its position. So we're going to change the position by changing its coordinates here. So you can see down there, I've now positioned that. I'm going to reposition the logo in a similar way to another part. Um, so let's So you can see that the, these are elementary ways to assemble and layer up uh, your, your graphic elements. Thank you, Alex. In the spirit of um, creating smaller video chunks, we're going to stop there and reconvene um, uh, once we've um, I don't know, Alex, if you want to clear the track so that you can show something else, but um, uh, that's where we're going to stop and come back shortly. So you'll see that um, Alex has now moved the ragged logo into the top right hand corner. And Alex, over to you. Where would you like to take us next? Right. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is first we're going to save this. All right. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, I want to uh, do audio um, editing in another piece of software. So first, I'm going to do that as a task so that I can then, ex firstly, export the audio and then re-import a cleaned version of the audio uh, with added features that I want and reposition it and associate reassociate it with the video files. So we're going to go down to audio uh, export in file preference uh, files, and we're going to look for media, and that will bring up this. This is a very important window because when you've created your video and you want to output it as a final file, like an MP4 or an AVI file. Um, that you will put in a public place uh, like Meta Cafe or YouTube or your favorite upload site. Um, these are all the settings. This is this is how you're configuring that final uh, outputted file. 
So firstly, I'm going to select the entire sequence. And for the purposes of um, the, uh, the process that I'm interested in, I am looking to export uh, a WAV file. So it's not exporting any of the video. It's just the WAV file. I've selected that by selecting the format. And you can see all the different options you've done, got down here from AVI to MPEG2 uh, to TIFF to audio. Uh, but today what I'm going to be showing you are the two most popular and useful formats, which is the H.264 codec, which produces the MP4 file, the video file, and just now the waveform audio. Right. So yeah, we've talked about waveform audio and how it 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 it's it is a sound file that keeps its quality. I, I mean, uh, MP3s also keep their quality. It should, we should be clear about yeah. that. But a waveform is is if you like the raw file, isn't it? Yes. That you, right. And that's what you're going to be working on now. Yes, if I'm doing video editing, uh, sorry, audio editing, I I need to work with uh, high information files, and a WAV file has high information. It it allows me to do more uh, in other software applications. So I'm going to select where this is going to be uh, saved and uh, we're going to put it in music and uh, I'm going to name it properly so So I'm calling it Antonio Darder Film Audio Export. In complex projects, uh, I like to uh, date the the files because I might do uh, multiple exports um, and work on different versions. So I want to make sure that it's uncompressed so that I've got all the maximum information to be able to work with that. So, uh, and now I select export and it uses the codec to export the, the audio file. So, right now I'm going to uh, import the um, the audio file that you've been working on. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, that mean no. This is uh, for our. Th this is just an example. I've not done any uh, any of the the um, removal of background noise or mm -hmm. or audio editing, uh, but. This is just to show how you export and import the audio files. Good, thank you. Um, if if you were to show us um, the um, the audio editing, what what software would you have been using? Well, I've I have used uh, and use um, Audacity, which is a wonderful open source program. Uh, Adobe. Audition, which uh, has uh, great functionality, and for some projects where you really want to clean up uh, a heavily distorted sound file, uh, something that say got a lot of noise in the background, uh, Isotope. Isotope's a very good audio restoration. 
And very expensive. It's very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, do do use your com- your friends' computers when you can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, yeah. So, right, you can see that I've now imported the audio file into the audio bin, right? And we'll just go back to the audio bins, the the three bins we set up, the audio, the graphics, and the video, right? And we can cause them to drop down and be open or be closed like that. And if you want to have them pop up as a window, you just double click on them. So get used to manipulating your your workspace so you're comfortable with it. Uh, And uh, a well-organized workspace means you know where everything is and ultimately it saves time. so firstly right we are going to remove the old audio right um but what i'm going to do is move this out and oh so how did you do that then alex so you moved moved the um tracks um along the right slide okay so certain things you can use so say uh you can see that i've again i've not moved from the selection tool but i'm using that selection tool to draw a box over the things i want to work with so one one element selected two elements selected three elements selected right and we're talking about three elements just now if you want to you can create them as a group you see so i can now move that back and forth as as i would like we're going to ungroup, right? Now, I'm just moving that out, this out into the middle of the timeline. So it's it's a bit obvious. And I, I like to have a, a bit of space at the beginning because I'm going to ultimately end up inserting the title uh, element at the beginning saying this is a video of Antonia Darda talking about her work uh, in um, participatory action research. So uh, I am going to take the audio file and drag that out again onto the uh, timeline and it's now sitting in, I'll move it up into audio two. So to demonstrate this um, layering effect, we'll, we can press play. As we watch all sorts of ways, I'll just, um, I would like to marginalize people that we accept, create exceptional things. And in the process, process, when that kind of sterilization of forward and customers, kind of especially the way that we are not going to be able to do that. Right. So <laughs> you can hear two tracks are playing over each other. I'm going to now. Uh, do that again. Why are stage work was so essential, especially in such from the get-go? For that, you know, the very first chapter it begins with the, the notion of it is the historical of the, the sense of being a historical subject means that I that I'm born within a moment, a historical moment, as we all are. In that long enough of times that so, so you can see the layering that's going on. And because you've re-imported the audio, it's very 
it's very significant you line it up with the video uh, in the right way. Um, if you get if you misalign the the audio and the video, it can be very distracting for anybody viewing when words are being spoken and the lips aren't moving in in time with the. the there's a lovely um, function here where I can select the two audio files and uh, look for synchronize. Now, the way I did that is by using my cursor to drag a box over the elements that I'm using. And I right click to bring up my options. And I can see synchronized there. And it gives me the opportunity to synchronize via audio. And synchronize the track to the first audio track. Now it's comparing the two audio tracks and it's going to hopefully line up the one that I've just imported so that it matches. And you can see it's snapped to the... Um, now I'm going to make this bigger. Again, we've got sliders here so that we can see a bit more of the information and what's happening. So, and we can maximize any given window. Remember the, the apostrophe key? So I've selected this window, this, this panel, and by pressing the apostrophe shortcut, it fills the whole space. So I can fill the whole space with the, the apostrophe key and we can see the waveform, right? And that synchronized function has done a beautiful job of comparing the two audio files and making sure this new one exactly matches where the old one is. So, okay, so we're, we're, we're now at this point where we can see we've got two audio files. One, which is the old, which we don't want, and one, which is the new, which we do want to keep. This is the processed one. It's been cleaned up uh, and is, is audio produced. So firstly, I'm going to drag a box over the video and the audio, the original footage. And the, there are two files here and they're stuck to each other, right? And we want to right click and unlink them, all right? This means that the video is now separate, separated from the audio, and that we can just select the audio, the files we don't want, and press delete, and we can then move this file up and we can group those right so that's that's how you export audio files work on those separately, then re-import, 
and reassociate uh, the audio ready for your your cutting. In this next part, I'm going to show you a rudimentary way of working out uh, and working through a piece of footage so that you can see what you want to keep uh, in a linear way. There are more um, refined processes that you can use uh, for selecting and importing to uh, your timeline. I'll give you a, a brief demonstration here. So say I've got a piece of footage here and I know that there's a an important part of that which I want to then bring in to my timeline. I can double click on it. Right. And we're just going to again. Right. So this brings it up into the source monitor. This, this is the source monitor window. This is simply showing the, the footage and I can watch it. Right. Uh, we can skip through, we can go, okay, so I say, want to, right, so I want to take this part, so you can see this cursor here, now I'm going to press I, the short keyboard shortcut of I, and you can see that is marking where the video comes in. Right. And I'm going to move it over and for the purposes of illustration go, okay, this is where I want the video element to finish, to go out, like press the keyboard shortcut of O. You can see there, it's a short piece of the whole footage, and I can just drag that down onto the timeline. You see? But it's only that section of that particular piece of source footage. And that's another way of working uh, in, in Adobe Premiere. So almost building up a, a video through the source material yes. by, by um, selecting sections of the, of the video and bringing them into the... Yes. So uh, a, uh, a lot of people will sit and they'll listen mm -hmm. to the content and they'll work out. But there are multi multi-dimensional forces that we are engaging with and people, in, there's also the, the, the politics of geography, right? So where we grow up. And you can, you can move things by frame by frame. So here, both in this window and in this window, you can set things precisely by changing the frame here by numerical means by dragging the the cursor here but also for your fine tuning you can move frame by frame through the footage so that you get exactly the frame that you want to start on and end on. And you can fit the whole thing. You, this, this is the resolution at which you're seeing things in. The higher the resolution, the more processing power you're, you're going to be calling on your computer to use. Mm. This is how much, how, how much uh, real estate, the visual real estate is going to be taken up so that 10% of its size. This is a 100% of its size. 
This is about 400% of its size. And this is to fit in the window. So I see the whole frame, right? And so, yeah, that's, but what I'm going to show you is, so we'll just delete that and is a very simple way of working. I like simple. <laughs> so uh, we're going to um, create a, a title for this. Right. I'm going to place my cursor here. So because there's no, there are no graphic elements, there's no footage here, we're seeing nothing. And it's just going to, it's just a display of black. I'm going to go here. And I'm going to create a title. And I'm going to call this opening title. And I'm presented with this. And I'm now going to uh, it's naturally on the type tool. I'm going to draw a box and that has a cursor in it. I'm going to do the, the title for the video. So Antonia Barder Fox Wild Her Work in Participatory Action Research. Right. And now I want to select all of that. So I've used another a keyboard shortcut. So pressing control A will select all within the element. So you can see now all of that's highlighted. That's handy. I want to center that text and I'm going to change back to the selection tool and use these boxes, these nodes to close down the dead space and use this to center vertical and horizontally and I want it just above the middle point and let's bold. So, so you can see how you go about changing the font, the font size, the leading. You know, you've got lots of options here. I, I'm going to keep it simple here. And once, once you've got it how you want it, you go and you close that. So I'm just going to grab that. Gonna take it down into my timeline. Gonna close this. Right. Wherever the cursor is, it will display in your your viewing window here. So I'm gonna take that right. That's the first thing that everybody's gonna be seeing. I want to change its duration. So right click. Select, right click, speed duration, right? and I want that to appear for uh, eight seconds, right? And you'll see it gets bigger. It's now eight seconds, and we're gonna select all of this, and we're gonna bring this gently along. And you notice when you bring some one element close to another, it will snap too. So it'll naturally sit snugly. And that's me zooming in to see this. And I can now press play and see how it's going to look 
for the final view. Uh, um, we wanted to introduce you, um, Antonia, first and foremost, to uh, the wonderful book that she's just published. It's a student guide to right. the Press. Uh, and we wanted to introduce you to Antonia first and foremost, and then to the Press. That was quite a swift transition, wasn't it? It was a swift transition, yes. So, typically, this is when we start to... I should say an evident transition. <laughs> mm. uh, so, whenever we uh, are moving from one element to another, we want to think about how the viewer experiences that. And we can choose how that uh, transition appears visually. So, we've got lots of options, and these options are found in the effects, right? So, I simply use this drop-down menu to select the effects, and I'm going to the video transitions. Now, Cross Dissolve is a very well-used way of getting from one clip to another. And all you'd, whenever you want to add any of these effects, you simply move your mouse pointer over, you left-click and hold to grab that, and you drag that over and you place that where you want it. So you can see where it is now. And I drop that. And we'll just zoom in. To remind you of how I'm zooming in, I'm holding the Alt key and using the mouse wheel to zoom in, to roll in and make that bigger on the timeline. Right. Now, that's the cross dissolve. We can see what it looks like now by pressing play. Um, but, um, we wanted to introduce you. Right. So maybe I want to make that bigger. And I put my cursor over it and I right click and I can set the duration here. Or I can clear it if I've changed my mind. So I'll set the duration. Currently, it happens over one second. Uh, let's make that three seconds. And you can see, again, it fills three seconds worth of the real estate on the timeline. So... Um, but um, we wanted to introduce you, um, Antonia, first and foremost, to... Right. So, that is one type of transition that you can create. And there are lots of others, like dip to black, uh, dissolve, morph cut. You can experiment with these. They're very simple and you will find that there are similar uh, options with audio transitions and uh, exponential fade is where you go out and constant gain is where you come in and so there's you've got a basic transition where the audio now increases slowly. We'll set that. Um, but, um, we wanted to introduce you, um, Antonia, first and foremost, to uh, the wonderful book that she's just published. Use the term fade in. Ah, the fade in, yes. Okay. To make this simple video, um, I will want to cut out the things that I don't want there. So, uh, this is where the razor tool comes in. And I will show you this demonstration. Um, so, so, I saw where Antonia started speaking. All right. 
And I can see that on the timeline just down here, the wave, the, the wave files down here. So I can see where she started to speak here, and I can place a cut just before that. And I can cut into the video by placing the cursor near to that, and it naturally snaps to the first cut that I've made below, so that it's synchronous. I'm making these three cuts there. Right. And Right, so I want to remove this section, right? And I'm going to place the cursor just here. Going to cut there, cut there, and cut there. So as long as I'm, I have the razor tool collect, selected, whenever I left click my mouse over a piece of media, it will slice that piece of media into two pieces. And I can use the selection tool because you can see now I can select the individuals. So I can now select the pieces of footage and graphics that I want to remove. I can press delete and manipulate things that way or I can uh, undo things that's a helpful function so control Z will undo the last action you've done you can also uh, undo and redo actions from the menu up here in edit but say I want to remove all of this stuff and bring everything to the right snugly up against the the previous footage that I'm, I'm keeping I can right click and select ripple delete and you can now see that all the footage to the right has been moved to the left to fill that space that was being taken. The last thing I will show you uh, in this section is some of the, the uh, effects that you can apply. There's lots that you can experiment with. And the video effects, in the video effects, the useful, very useful, simple ones might be the sharpen tool. So you might have footage that's not quite as sharp as you'd like. So you, when I want an effect, I grab it over here. I move it onto the footage and I drop it. When you say not quite as sharp, could you tell the beginner right. stroke intermediate <laughs> <laughs> student what that means? So, uh, when, you, when you've been filming something and you're not using professional equipment or you, you've uh, set something to automatically record, the focus of the lens may not have, have given a, an image that's really crystal clear. And you can compensate them for that to an extent. So let's zoom right in here and uh, see. You can see here that Antonia is not quite 
as sh sharp as one would like. Right, so I can apply the effect of sharpen and I've dragged that from the menu onto the piece of footage and it's appeared here. Right? And I can make in, apply that and you can see that it it applies mm -hmm. sharpness. It improves things to an extent. Uh, and this is at 200%, and I'll put that back to fit. But ultimately, it ends up um, being more, uh, more visually appealing. So say I want to zoom in, or I will be wanting to zoom in and lose a lot of this surrounding space. Right? I'll put that at 150%, you see? And uh, 180, right? So the more I zoom in, the more it, it, it is evident that I have uh, the the footage is is not in focus. Um, sharpen is one of these things that uh, can can improve things to an extent, and you can do things like uh, change the color and contrast. So I'm going to apply that effect now. And I move this slider, this effect slider down, and we can see now where that control is. I can increase the brightness and decrease it. So I'll increase it and I'll adjust the contrast. So Um, and you can do things, uh, a lot of things with lumetri color. That's very worth knowing about. So I'll drop that on, and you can do things such as increase the temperature. That will make the picture warmer. See, mm -hmm. from blue tones mm -hmm. to orange tones. And it can make something a lot more pleasant to look at, and you can restore color this way. You can increase the exposure. Um, so that's now overexposed, and that's now underexposed. So these these are how you correct uh, the footage that you've got, and you can work through all the different settings here. Um, a lot of people might use crop to give an effect, and that gives the impression of a cinematic effect. Uh, so right, at a hundred percent, right. So you can see by putting that crop effect on, it frames the subject and it can make footage uh, uh, much, much more approachable. When you apply an effect and you want to see what it looks like uh, when it's on and off, here, next to each effect, you can toggle the effect on and off. So I'm going to switch it off, on, off, on, and sharpen off, Done.
brightness off on and this is this is the the general way you work with footage so now you have gone through all your footage and you're ready to you've cut out all the things that you don't want you've put transitions between uh, the adjoining clips you've put your your titles in you've got it all ready to show the world you save your project and it's ready to export so we go down to export media and we're met with this window again and we want to go down and select the H264 codec. This is a very well established codec that compresses things well. It produces the MP4 format uh, and it's, it's uh, highly recognized, very compatible. So I'm going to select the entire sequence. Now, of course, you can choose to only render a small part of this. Say you've got uh, you know, two hours of footage and you want to make four pieces of film from that footage. You do it that way. Um, I want to name the MP4 and pick where it's going to be saved. And and I name it the final cuts. And now down here in your video and audio settings, you can choose how at what quality you're going to render this video and currently it's 32 minutes and it's uh, 2352 megabytes that's excessive quality for our purposes because nobody's going to be viewing it at that level of quality. Unless they have a very powerful computer. They, they need an indoor cinema. Yeah. <laughs> There's, unless you're doing very high definition work, uh, which needs to be shot on high definition equipment, which uses calibrated screens, you know, Unless you, you, you really invested time in the equipment and how to use it, you're looking to make much smaller definition files. Um, so you can choose your bit rate and by reducing your bit rate. So I'll choose three here. You can see that it's reduced the size of the file considerably. So the, the target bit rate is megabits per second. And the more, uh, the, the higher the bit rate, the more time it will take to render. Uh, the maximum bit rate allows a bit of flexibility. The more, more effects you add, the, sometimes you will need the higher maximum bit rate uh, so that the effects might not be juddery. So let's put it at four. There's not really any reason for, for having it high. Uh, let's make it two, 500 megabits, uh, megabytes file and I, your your audio will be uh, as as you've done 
edited in uh, your other uh, suites like Adobe Audition. Uh, I generally import as a compressed MP3. It's it's better practice to use smaller files unless you're in the creative industry, I think. Um, uh, and then you export. So click on export. And this is where your computer will parse how much work it's got to do. And it will give you an estimated time. Uh, I would recommend that you keep your computer as cool as possible. Um, if you've got a graphics card, the better graphics card you've got, the, the faster this will be. Um, this takes up a lot of working memory it of takes, the computer. takes up a lot of working memory of the computer. So we can draw parallels if we wish to with um, human working memory. <laughs> So, so the things to remember is you need a lot of space, right? So wherever you're, ideally you want to save your file to a drive that's different to the drive that you've been working in. So here you can see I've got two, uh, I've partitioned my drive into C and D drive. Right. I store files here and I store programs here. Uh, ideally, what I want to do is save my files, uh, the rendered files to a separate, you know, to the D drive. I want to make sure that I've got at least four times the amount of space that I need. So this, this file is 528 megabytes in size. So I need at least two gigabytes, two and a half gig free space to work with. Mm. Otherwise, uh, it will fail to render. There's a lot more going on than we're witnessing. Uh, That's useful to know. So you'd be wasting your time if you were trying to do this on a near full drive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, keep the the simpler th you keep things, the uh, the better the outcome, and you won't stress your your computer. Your computer has limited capabilities, mm -hmm. and uh, you. Keeping your computer cool will mean your processors won't burn out. So, uh, with good editing techniques and uh, clarity of purpose, you can uh, do create very nice videos without using fancy effects. I agree, and. For the purposes for which we're creating materials, uh, unless you're you're wanting to do something which relates to marketing and education, or you're wanting to create a commercial product, which maybe you will be, um, it, it, you don't need to create something which is so high quality that a the the quality won't display on a computer, and we. What we're interested in more is the educational design of the videos. I think it's worth saying that now. So if you're creating, you can create a beautiful, high quality video in terms of resolution, etc. But in, in the final analysis, what we're looking for is the educational design that relates to these things. So it's just a little reminder that um, when, we're, when we're thinking about video production for educational purposes, we're thinking as much, if not significantly more about the design than we are about the production value. 
And that's, that's useful to know in terms of your assignment. <laughs> you, you don't need to create this beautiful high-end um, um, video uh, unless you're doing that with ulterior motives in that you're creating the commercial product, etc. Alex, I'd like to thank you because this 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 uh, this process, this encoding process, will take a long time. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'd like to thank you very much now for uh, Im imparting some of your skills um, to to those people who um, would like to engage with them on the multimedia course. I think it's been very useful. Uh, I think we've learned a lot. And there's a lot more we could have said, for example, in relation to sustainability, there are lots more functions that we could have explored. But I think that's a very useful um, initial overview. So thank you very much, um, Alex, for doing that for us. Uh, and good luck with um, Ragged. I'm looking forward to us commencing, recommencing um, our Ragged um, uh, talks. And those will hopefully recommence next next year in Manchester. And if anybody is in Manchester, um, you're welcome to to those talks when they commence. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, and good luck, everybody, and uh, in, enjoy video ed editing. Cheers. <laughs> Bye. Yeah.